Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I've only been taped once before in my life and it did not work well. So I'm hopeful that this is a, a more forgiving environment and the video works better this time. <laughs> my name is Linda Street. Is Maureen going to introduce me? Are you? Go ahead and introduce yourself. <laughs> So we spent some time in his place and then moved back to, right now we live in Galewood in a, one of the little box houses that populate that neighborhood and we are very happy. So we're re-engaged at Grace. I call myself a retread because I was there for the first however many years of my life and now I'm back. So um, part of that reintroduction to Grace was trying to find a ministry that suited us and we ended up working with refugees at Grace. And that's why I was invited to speak to you today because I understand you have a heart for refugees in this congregation as well. <laughs> well, welcome. Well, I'm going to open us with a prayer that um, Cleo shared with us and fits very poetically for today. Let's be in the mind of prayer. God who knows loss. You see each of your children who have fled war and persecution. We pray for those who grieve what has been left behind. God, who is a sustainer, you are the bread of life and living water. We pray that those who flee will be given warm food and drink to sustain their bodies and spirits. God, who is a refugee, you know the weariness and the pain of those looking to find rest. May all, seeking in refuge, may all seeking refuge in neighboring countries find a safe place to lay their heads tonight. God who pours out blessings. You see the support of the global community providing aid to refugees. Thank you for each hand involved and may we all faithfully serve those searching for a new home. God who does not forget. You know the present and the future. Let us remember those who have fled when they arrive in our cities and homes. Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. 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 <coughs> I love the time right? yeah. these people find a bed tonight. Yeah. 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 Um, my name is really big, <clears throat> not because I'm proud of myself, but you can take a photograph and there's my email, so if you decide you want more information for want to join up to help with one of our new teams, you know, there it is. So this part, you cannot read from where you're sitting, but I do have some handouts if you are interested in the Refugee One process. Their commitment is from pre-arrival, working with the refugees where they're coming from, and training the teams here in Chicago, all the way through, this is the first 90 days, which is a big part of the initial um, project, I guess, getting people acquainted and familiar and feeling safe. And the rest of these details are what they do for the next five years. So <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit more of that in my notes, but I really like the way that lays out their program. So if you'd like to take one of those, or um, you could look at Refugee Online, Refugee One Online, and I'm sure it's available there too. Um, I did write some notes just so I don't wander down too many rabbit holes because I have a tendency to do that when I talk is <laughs> we get on a sidetrack from then. So let me just breeze through this and then we'll have some questions, okay? Um, you know some of this stuff already. So first of all, before we start, are any of you immigrants or relatives of immigrants or know somebody who is an immigrant? Do any of you have that in your past, in your family? Yeah, who do you know? Well, my grandfather was in the from Sweden. From Sweden? In when? In the like, early mid 1900s. Mid early 1900s. Okay, and you? Um, I had some classmates that were immigrant immigrated here to, to study. Yeah, so people in your own age group, right? Yeah. yeah, a lot of us are familiar with older folks who came here years ago, and that's our immigrant 
background, and, and then we meet folks that are newly immigrant or arrived, and that's kind of cool to see. Um, we uh, have come across some vocabulary words that are not exactly interchangeable. Refugee, immigrant, or um, asylum seeker. Um, an immigrant is a person who comes from their country, usually has a passport, arrives here with permission, um, and they can become a citizen of the United States or um, change their status as they see fit. They have some options. Refugees uh, are people who are living without, outside of their country and they're unwilling to return to their home country or they're unable to return to their home country because of circumstances that can be documented. You can't just wander in and go, I want to be a refugee. There has to be a documentable reason for that uh, title that goes to you. And an asylum seeker is a person just like a refugee, but they already live here. And so they got on a plane or a boat, and somehow they came to our country, and then they're seeking asylum once they're here. So those are three slightly different um, takes on the same idea. You come from somewhere else, but how are you categorized? Back in May, um, my husband and I were attending some lectures on refugees, and at that point, well before COVID, well before um, the Afghan refugee crisis, there were a lot of people on our southern border, and that was the crisis of the day. You know, we were all thinking, how can we help these folks? And so we got involved with the Lutheran Immigration Refugee Service. They go by acronym BLURS. And they had several discussion groups and planning and talking and thinking. And we spent a lot of time talking about our feelings. And uh, my husband, being former military, and I'm a school teacher by trade, we were ready to like do something. So how can I actually help a family? I really don't want to talk about helping people anymore, although that's a very noble thing. I need to figure out how to buy a can of beans for a family who needs food, or you know, something like that. I wanted more hands-on. But yes, we were having these conversations. The story of the Good Samaritan is always front and center. Um, we, have, we will be having more people coming in as this goes on for certain people. Just busy doing other things. So, um, in the Good Samaritan story, we usually want to identify ourselves with the Good Samaritan. He was the hero and the good guy, right? But um, we pay attention also to the priest and the Levite who were the good one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. But in the New Testament, Jesus added and love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really a um, meaningful addition to the New Testament piece of this, that we're not just, it's not just a relationship between us and God and keeping the commandments. There's a neighbor piece to this. We're to care for each other. Other things from the Bible, Cain speaks to God, and I, my brother, is keeper, and God replies, the voice of your brother's blood cries out from the ground to me. So God hears the voices of people in trouble. Matthew 25, I was a stranger and you took me in. Perhaps it's the Lord himself who are helping. Acts 4, the example of the earliest Christians who sold their personal possessions to distribute the proceeds to those in need. Talk about sacrificial giving. Do you know that phrase, sacrificial giving? Mm -hmm. Well, these guys did it in Acts, for real. Okay, okay, we get it. But what do we do? How do people at Grace or Pharaohs or Pilgrim help people who are so, so far away? Well, there's two things to note. By the 1920s, no, I like, by the 2020s, 2021 is the date of this fact. The number of refugees worldwide is the highest it's been in over 75 years. That did not include Afghanistan. That did not include Ukraine. So even when this statistic was so shocking, we've piled onto that twice more over. And the countries of origin for our refugees and our immigrants change over time. 
time. So the U.S. policy has tried to keep up with that, but they struggle. And when a person comes to our country in need of help, it's really difficult to figure out which piece of paper you need or which person is the one to give you the good advice. So let's brainstorm for a minute. What would be driving these people to flee their country? Anybody have any ideas? Why do refugees want to come? War, hugely one, right now in our face, right? Yeah. Famine. Famine, good. So the crops aren't growing, you have no food, there's no water. I agree. What else? Yes. Oppression. Oppression, right. Um, and we, yeah, we've seen that in our own news. Um, I have um, dictatorship also, food insecurity and hunger is, is the famine idea, and persecution of their group, depending on somebody just doesn't like them for some reason. You know, they, they've not done anything horrible, they're just the other in, in their culture. Well, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees was appointed in 1950. And I read about him when we were getting involved with the um, refugees, and I actually saw this person on television when they were talking about Ukraine. He's actually a real person that's doing a job. I mean, he goes wherever refugees are and coordinates all of the UN efforts to get refugees settled and resettled and established in new homes. And they are the most visible global and um, aid organization on the planet today, really. So there are lots of other folks doing lots of other things, but when it starts in the first country where the refugees are collecting themselves, the UN is the boots on the ground initially. Our Rohingya family, Grace started with a Rohingya family about six months ago. And this family, um, I don't know if you remember the Rohingya people, they were living in Myanmar and they were, they were victims of genocide in that country. So many of them fled to Malaysia. They've been living in refugee camps in Malaysia for decades, actually. The children in the family don't remember life outside of the refugee camp. They actually attended school there. It was a UN school and the older children attended school there in the camp. Um, and they really had no help of any change there because even though Malaysia didn't kill them, they were never allowed to be citizens there. They couldn't get a passport claiming that they were from Malaysia, so they were kind of from nowhere. Uh, they couldn't hold any kind of decent jobs. The children weren't allowed in school except for in the refugee camp. So they weren't persecuted to death in Malaysia. But there certainly was a ceiling above which they were not going to be able to rise. So they have been waiting, filing papers to try to come to the U.S. After about 10 years, they finally were granted an opportunity to come to the United States. Um, they, uh, I'm trying to think where this, all right, I'll tell you about the Afghan family too, as long as we're kind of introducing the families. Um, our Afghan family has been here about four months. We are partnering with Pharaoh's Presbyterian to work with that family. Um, they came as part of the films that we all saw on television, the news. Uh, those folks running, you know, and, and throwing over walls and in a mess of mash of people was this family. They had contacts with the U.S. Embassy, which was good, and then suddenly extremely dangerous. So while they were um, living in Afghanistan, no idea of evacuation, the husband in this family passed away. And then came the evacuation. And then they just ran for their lives with everything they had. So we have a widow and six children and nothing. <coughs> They were evacuated to one of the neighboring countries, eventually sent to a military base in Wisconsin, where they were given a few um, toiletries and you know, two clean t-shirts and a bag of stuff. Um, so they, they came to us in a very different situation. The Rohingyas had been preparing for a long time for coming to the US. They got off the plane with five enormous suitcases that had all their things that, you don't know, imagine trying to put all your belongings into suitcases. I mean, it was, they, 
pack them. They will have their own seasonings and some medicine and clothes and pots and pans and, you know. And the Afghan family came with a yellow plastic reinforced garbage bag for each person. And that's what all, that's all they have. So each family you receive with a refugee family isn't going to be the same. You can't do the cookie cutter thing with each family. Um, so anyways, we realized when we were starting to process this that we were in over our heads. So we partnered with a company called Refugee One. And you guys are already partnered with Exodus. Is it Exodus something? Exodus World Service. Exodus World Service. Okay. I know we're all good church people and we like all help people, but we don't know half the wickets that you have to jump through to try and relocate a family in America. But these organizations do. And, and so with the partnership with Refugee One, um, the people came to us were already screened by the UN in their country. They were already screened by the US State Department. They came to Refugee One in Chicago as one of the largest refugee resettlement agencies in the city. And um, when we met our families at the airport, there was actually a physical handoff between Refugee One people and the immigration services. They had big names on their vest and all, you know, official things were happening that I, as a Grace Church member, as much as I love them, would not have known how to do things properly so that everything was lined up for them to succeed. Um, so the partnership with Refugee One works. I don't know how Exodus works. You're going to have to share with me how, it, how it's done with you guys. Um, there was training for the team. We have a team of about eight folks that go to actually visit the family and work with them. And that's a good number because then when somebody's absent and can't go, there's a backup. But you don't want um, a wide circle of rotating strangers coming into the family's you know, environment. So the fact that we took pictures of ourselves, put them on the wall and on a little page, the refrigerator, and uh, so they would recognize us and feel safe when we came. So there was training for the team members. We did some fundraising, collecting household goods. That sounds like what you guys are just finishing up doing. Um, we also had to donate $10,000 to Refugee One for the first months of the family's bills. So it paid for their rent and utilities and emergency supplies. Um, and Grace does not write the checks for that. Refugee One does which is great because then they send a case manager and someone says, you need sheets. Well, you shouldn't need sheets. Somebody's providing those. So they carefully monitor how that money is spent. It doesn't go straight to the family and it's not left in my pocket because we already said I know nothing, right? So I need somebody who knows things to make those decisions. Um, we gathered all the recommended household goods we shop for culturally appropriate food for the family because they have different tastes than we do, so there was a list. We moved all this stuff to the apartment that Refugee One rented in the Rogers Park neighborhood. And this is a really multi-ethnic neighborhood, and our families feel more comfort there. Um, there's that little India stretch on Devon where there's lots of more culturally appropriate food and there are people in the neighborhood that will speak their languages. So, um, all right, so after that, our first family, we have a core team of about eight people, I told you, and they've been making weekly visits with this Rohingya family. They've been here now six months and our timeline with with Refugee One and the co-sponsor group, their team, um, is a six-month requirement. And so we visited several times a week, then once a week, then we tried to stretch it out, but we fell in love with them, so we visited more often, and this is the requirement, and this kind of happens. Um, we played games, we got to know them, we provided things that, were, that they needed that weren't on the initial list, like a, uh, water, purifying water filter thing, no, we call those things. Um, Brita? Like a Brita, yeah. Because they were dragging these big bottles of water up the stairs into their apartment, and I thought, well, if you have one of these, you can pour the faucet water in there and then feel, you know, safe about drinking it. I have one in my house, so. Um, all right, so the kids were just delightful. They all went to school. The little girl gave us 
thumbs up because she couldn't speak English, but she had seen us doing this to people. So the first time she visited, her mom opened the door and she did this. <laughs> this darling, darling, how could you not fall in love? But meanwhile, these people have been here six months, so they're supposed to be kind of done with us, right? Um, and, and officially, we actually done a debriefing with Refugee One and discussed some needs that still need to happen. The wife and their family still needs to get through the mess at DMV to get an ID card, so we're working with her to make that happen. But beyond this, um, you know, we're going to be visiting them because we want to, not because they need us anymore. They got uh, here early, then winter came. It's hard to teach somebody how to ride a bus in Chicago in the winter, especially when they're used to living in Malaysia. So they cold, and the, mm, this was not a good time for them. So uh, we will stay on track and take some practice bus rides and ride the L and the train and figure out you know, how they can best access things. Um, but again, it's not they don't need us as much as they did initially. But we do enjoy their company. And one of our team members is interested in working as a mentor with the kids. Like once they start one of the boys into high school next year, we need a little more help to avoid the gangs in the city and try to negotiate how to get the good grades to get the college scholarship to, you know, these are all steps along the way that our children all know, but these kids don't. So they need some help there. Um, the Afghan family, we have a second core team. So the first core team is with one family, and the Pharaohs and Grace combined core team is with the Afghan family. <coughs> um, yeah, they, well, I already shared, they, they are working on a whole other set of issues. Um, but it's, it's interesting for, in my position because I see both families. And the Rohingya family group just sees that family. And the Afghan group just sees that family. And, and I think, for me, it's just a bad thing. Because people have stepped up who are eager to not impose their religion or their peanut butter and jelly sandwich or their favorite TV show, but to just be open to loving these families and accepting them where they're at and helping them to feel safe and comfortable. Um, yeah, the, the Afghan family at the moment has a harder task because they have no breadwinner. The father died in Afghanistan before they came. So this was not at all in their plan. Um, and so it, it's probably going to be more than six months that we deal, you know, with trying to help them too. I really love the Refugee One idea that these families are independent. So there are some tough conversations that have to happen, like can your teenage boy get a job? Can we help you some way besides just giving you the money for rent every month? You need to become independent. So the mother have a job. So um, I, I like that mm, goal of independence for the families that we work with. I also like the fact that Refugee One stays with them and available to them for five years. I don't have to stay. My whole Grace and Pharaoh's team doesn't have to stay with them for five years, but Refugee One will. So if somebody gets sick or has an accident or loses a job, they can call back to that resource and say, okay, this is what happened. What can you help me with? And they will. So, they help. so that's all that I can add. Do you have any questions? Oh, well, before I do that, if you're not happy at Exodus, I would welcome you to join us. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. No, I, I, won't, I won't steal you. Uh, uh, Exodus is a different uh, kind of organization. They work with Refugee One. Oh, they do? And what they do is organize the, um, the setup of an apartment uh -huh. and the provisions for the people who are coming into this country. Right. They don't get involved with exciting and fun, but we, we have no particular ongoing relationship with the families that we're supporting. Right. Um, and I think there's some sense that we'd like to have that relationship and be, yeah. a, be a more support. Right. Right. Actually get to know them. 
I didn't know actually this worked. I don't think they were for Refugee One. They were when it, them. They supply that piece for yeah. Refugee One families. Because when we were, I see, <laughs> when we were um, having so many Afghan refugees come, um, we said, do you want us to take another family? And they said, no, we have other people that can help set up the apartments, particularly if there aren't a lot of kids or, you know, then, okay. Well, let's go to that. Yes, um, I have a couple of questions. One, um, uh, Refugee One is in charge of finding the housing? Y'all have to yes. worry at all about that? No. Is there any short, well, there can be three questions. Okay. This is a problem. Part B. Is there, any, yeah. is there any shortage of housing in the Rogers Park area? Are they having issues finding uh, um, appropriate housing? No. In fact, we were just, there are always apartments available there, is what we were told. And when we drove around, we thought, oh man, there are a lot of like rent available places. I think it's just a very fluid community, and so there's a lot of turnover. Um, that said, the, the Rohingya family drew the short straw and have a really horrible landlord. So mm -hmm. we're, we're anxious for them to finish their lease and we will help them move to another better place. We yeah. talked about $10,000 for yes. the one. Was that for family? Yes. Okay. And if you get a third family, there will be another. Yes. Um, and this is where we partnered with Fair Rights because they were interested in getting involved and they didn't have $10,000. And we said, well, how about if we share a family? And so then they raised some of the money and Grace put the rest in. And so we're still, uh, we came up with the money, you know. And so now we're working with people at Faroes. The visiting team is not quite half and half. I think there's an extra Faroes person on there. Um, but it's been, a, it's been a wonderful collaborative fellowship because they, their church congregation has different skill sets than we have. So we thought, man, if we could just get somebody to sew a dress. And they had a lady that sewed dresses, you know? So we are open to sharing another family if you guys would like to travel on that path, but that's, there has to be some talk before. I mean, I can't sign you over for that today. Yes, ma'am. All right. If Refugee One gives you a kind of a roadmap, um, um, I'm sure there's a lot of things on, on your congregation's mind of what the family might need or want, and the family also has ideas of what they might need or want. How, do you have any guidance or kind of something? Yeah, about that? Um, they gave us a list. I'm surprised you didn't get it. Didn't it say they need one table and chairs, they need three frying pans? Yeah. I mean, that's like a check off list for filling the apartment. What happens though is the cultures are so different. Um, we followed everything on the list with the Rohingya family because they were our first and we didn't know anything. And so whatever they said, a couch, a chair, a coffee table, you know, we checked it all off and we got used stuff that was still serviceable and we did that. But this, the African family said, we don't want anything. Well, I think they were shocked. You know, they were so happy to be alive. They, they, how do you think, what colored drapes do I want? I mean, you know, that was a, so yeah. Is there a similar list for like the, the stuff they need help with? So do I want to learn to ride the bus? Do I want oh, to Oh, 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 oh I see. You're not talking about the game. Yeah. learn to read English. Um, so yeah, each family is very different. And so when they arrive, you really don't know. In fact, you get about two or three days and they'll call you and say, we got a family, they're coming on Tuesday. And you're going, yeah. Um, and so then there's a mad rush to set up the apartment, buy the food, meet the family. Um, there is English as a second language being taught by Refugee One, and so they get signed up in that as part of that side of the house, not mine. Um, there's also uh, all the government documents and stuff, uh, signing up their utility bills. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Most, most of the official stuff is done by Refugee One, healthcare. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're on Medicaid um, for the time being when they're new, but once they have a job, sometimes that comes with healthcare benefits. So you know that's all would change, just like our jobs would have benefits or not. Um, there is supposed to be somebody in the family committed to being a breadwinner, and there is a whole employment section of Refugee One's office where that's that's what they do. They find jobs for folks. And usually they're manual, low paying jobs because they don't speak English very well. So um, their initial jobs are going to be enough to pay the rent, but not to buy food, and hopefully you can earn your way up from there. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. 
What about schools with mm -hmm. their connection? What about who? Schools. Um, school. They go to Chicago public. Yeah, they go to Chicago public schools. Um, and in the Rogers Park neighborhood, the schools are pretty good. Mm -hmm. I did hear comments about the high school in that area that there might be some gang activity that we need to be aware of. But um, I know, say it isn't so. Um, and so I'm thinking of, of the language part. Oh, the you know, language. The, you know, yeah. The parents get included in that too. So like mm -hmm. perfect English as a second language or early intervention with the kids that they're pre right. and all of that. Right. The two families that we have, the older kids speak English pretty well. Okay. Um, so they were either getting it at the refugee camp in Malaysia or their contacts in Afghanistan were already sharing English language with them. The, um, there, well, the one mother, the Rohingya mom, took the English as a Second Language courses through Refugee One. I think several levels. And she finished that, and so now she's got a certificate, and there's another agency that is teaching English to non-English speaking people. So that's why she needs this ID we're going on Tuesday to get, so she can get into that other section. Um, and that's why we're watching the one, the uh, eighth grade boy in the one family to make sure that he has some mentorship, and Refugee One has a mentorship program. But so far, this guy said, I don't need help. I'm cool. I'm fine. You know, it's an amusing thing for it. So, yeah, I mean, he knows so much about the world, right? But, I mean, he knows a lot more than our kids did at eighth grade, for sure. But, um, so we're, we're trying to convince him it would be wise to have some help in that area. I don't want him to waste his brain, is my thought. You know, uh, I mean, he has a good head. He speaks English fairly well. He should be able to improve his and his family's future and situation if he can focus on his education. That's my two cents. Yes, ma'am. Um, the Afghan family, you know, it's a single mother with six kids, and if the mother needs to learn English and then get a job eventually, who takes care of the younger children? This is part of the problem that is their family. Um, they have an older son who agreed to work, and now he's kind of changed his mind. He just don't want to. And so, um, yeah, I mean, families are families, right? That's what I see about this. Like, we, oh, I know a kid like that, right? So they're not, um, they're, they're more familiar to us than you would think in the family dynamics kind of stuff. So they're having conversations because the mom barely speaks English. The three girls are very small. One is 10 months old. Oh, so somebody would have to watch those three, even if the older three were in school. But then she would speak English. So um, we well, had some multiple problems because maybe kids speak English and the mother doesn't. But how can you expect the oldest kid to work and go to school at the same time. That's like well, a lot of us went to school and, and worked in college, and this is where he is. He would be a freshman in college. So okay. um, it's not going to be easy. Uh, the, the other boy, the middle boy, called me, actually, and was uh, very upset. He said, um, my father died, and my brother is not my father. And so, you know, what we're asking him to do was not on the older son's plan for his life. Yeah. And um, that's true, but the hard call is a lot of us have things that happen in our lives that weren't according to our plan, and we have to work through them. And um, so I'm, I'm curious. They were having meetings the end of last week about how are we going to resolve this. And the first thing was, okay, you 14 people, do not pay that rent because they want this family to try and work out a plan that, you know, if we just start paying the bills, then that's enabling them. And as hard as the tough load is, I mean, I don't want to bring them all home to my house. And that, you know, that's just not helpful. We need these folks to become independent. So, yes, ma'am. So I would guess that because of that savings, there's a great deal of trauma. Um, yes. Is, 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 does, do they provide trauma care? Do they have counseling? Yes. Um, in fact, with the Rohingya family, we did not get special training on trauma, but once all the Afghans were showing up, there was a special, everybody on the core team had to attend this trauma training. 
Uh, what does it look like? How can you deal with it? Where can you get help? And there are family counselors and grief counselors and um, what would be another? Anyways, professionally trained trauma folks that can help the families as needed. Yeah. Yes, sir. I was going to ask a similar question about the teams. Do they have resources or is it something the church might provide a resource? Like, I need therapy? Is that what you're telling me? Well, you need <laughs> guidance on it, you know, where yes, it's going to be a scheme of your I'm stuff. not making light of it. Yeah. You are right. I mean, we have had some, this was all COVID time, so we've had some Zoom meetings where people actually were crying. I mean, they said that this one bad landlord, oh my word, he was awful. And the family was stuck in that situation, you know? And, um, we were just heart sick about the whole thing. So, yeah, um, I think we comforted each other. I think if we had said to Refugee One, I'm losing it, you know, I need help, they, they would provide that for us as well. Yeah. The, the uh, UCC also has a process of training people in trauma and crisis management relating to refugees. They just launched it um, uh, maybe two weeks ago, three weeks ago. There's a Zoom call that you can attend. They have uh, spiritual guidance support. Uh, so there are resources available in the church. To so would you push those out like, in the site the and see what is happening? If you'd like, sure. And then I can circulate what I got. Yeah. I, I think um, there's no way that I could have ever been prepared in my personal life to greet an Afghan refugee or a Rohingya refugee who realized their family above them had been killed off in a slaughter. And, you know, how do you reassemble your life and come up with anything that makes any sense at all? I was sitting in the living room at the um, Afghan family apartment and the Ukraine thing had just happened. And uh, I asked the boys, the two older boys, one, the one is the college boy who doesn't, he wants to go to school, he doesn't want to work, and, um, and the other one's a high school boy, and their English is quite good, those two. What do they think about this Ukraine thing? And, and they looked at each other for a minute, and they said, we don't understand. And I thought, how poignant, really. I mean, they're Muslim, I'm a Christian, we don't hate each other, in fact, we're growing very of each other, you know? And I don't understand, and that's what they said. We didn't understand in Afghanistan where they came from. We don't understand. What, what, how are people thinking that war is a good idea or killing somebody or blowing things up? They, they just, that's where they were. They said, we don't, we don't understand. And they are very thankful for being in the United States and for the help that they're getting. Um, they do have some relatives in the area, and so they are, there is some extended family, and that may be the help for the whole job situation. If the uncles can step in and work out a plan, um, yeah, they, they just are amazing people. And I know you feel that because you've already collected stuff and supplied, you know, a, a little nest for somebody who could come. Um, I wonder if the family, you know, like, is very and is there a cultural <clears throat> difference in how we help each other? Yes. So in most of the families, can you touch? Can you put your hand on your shoulder? Yeah. Um, you the shoulder? Initially, you have to ask because you're just not sure. I mean, even American people go, I don't like to be touched. You know, but so you, you have to just see what is their personality. Um, I'm a hugger, so um, I'm always asking for forgiveness later when somebody jumps out of my arm across the room. <laughs> um, but, but I think the, the culture is, is human. And so if you are a caring person or a nurturing person, that comes to you naturally, regardless of what your culture is. Now, I think they would be uncomfortable if I hugged the husband, you know, because that's really not what they do. But we have some misunderstandings about, no, they don't allow photographs, because Muslim families sometimes don't 
had any artwork on their walls except very beautifully scripted <laughs> verses from the Quran. And, and so this Chinese telephoned its way into, don't take their photograph, they think you're stealing their soul, and, and, and this is like, where did that come from? You know, that is not true. They have photographs on their phone. In fact, the Afghan family showed a picture on their phone to me of their dad, remember, who had passed away before the evacuation. And I had brought pictures of my family just to say, hey, here's my daughter, here's my kids, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the older boy said, could you make a picture like that of my father? And so he wanted a hard paper copy of a photograph because when you're running for your life, you don't have all those things. So we made pictures, we got silver frames because the mom's favorite color was silver. And I presented them to the family on our next visit. And the boys looked at them and hugged them and they put the little smaller ones on the windowsill, but the larger ones they quickly took out of the room. So, you know, what they did with that is none of my business. But the fact that they asked, and that's, so you go to Walgreens and make a picture. I mean, how hard is that to do? So, um, I'm always touched by, by the normal human behavior of all of this. If you have a loving, open heart, um, and, and his family so far, the two that we've had, are so thankful. Um, <coughs> yeah, they don't call you every other afternoon and ask for a cup of sugar. You know, I mean, they, they're not needy. Um, they have other places to get help besides the poor team. So, um, we're just blessed to know them. And I would welcome you to chat among yourselves about do you want to do this? <coughs> um, we, we would be open, I think, to a third family. Our first family, I share with you, is already six months, so they're officially, they are on their own. Uh, and I don't know if everybody in that core team is going to stay attached to that first family. It might just be a couple, three people that stay in touch with them, and the rest of those guys would be interested in um, starting with a third family. So, I don't know. Chat them on your side. Thank you. Thank you. Five.